we now continue with this series. This message is the fall and rise of man. We are children of God, begotten of God, because all things were created by God, for God, of God, and within God. We are also children of Adam. By virtue of in that creation, God said, let everything bring forth after its kind. Now, Adam is created and placed in that garden. The garden is the promised land. They are the same thing. It is where man is abiding in the God that abides in man for the purpose of God. In the fall, Adam is removed from that place, and we inherit through Adam the effects of that fall. And by those effects, we are in truth the children of God born in Egypt. As children of God born in Egypt, Egypt, we must, as Adam, go to an altered doctrine in our relating to God than what was intended of God in creation's design. These doctrines may not be incorrect where they are, but they are incomplete, for they are not what God intended. These doctrines are all from the perspective of the lower nature of the trinity of man coming from that lower capacity. These doctrines are the limits of that lower capacity's ability to experience the life of God. We are created souls. What that soul actually is, is it's a nature. A nature that has an awareness that can recognize and experience the life that is God. Also within that nature that is our soul, we uh, are given um, inclinations. And through these inclinations, we give that life a personal and unique identity in God. I am Gordon. This life is God. The experience that we have with that life of God is between these two natures, which is the nature that is the life of God and the nature that is God created in that soul of man. This is all within the Trinity that is this vessel that we recognize ourselves, and this Trinity is spirit, soul, and body. Now in 1 Corinthians 6, 20, it says, You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, in this trinity, God says that life and that body, they are mine. Now, the soul, it is you. It is that created vessel that is you. This communion takes place with that life of God containing his nature and that nature of man within that created soul. These are the spirits spoken of in 1 Corinthians 2 and 11 and 12, where it says, What man knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man. That's that nature of man in that trinity. And it goes on to say that we've received the spirit of God, that we might know the things of God. That is that nature of God within the trinity. Now, by the design of creation, it is from the, this communion within that trinity that the administration of God takes place. It is where the, the eternal meets the temporal and functions. Through this design, man is made functional in both realms, in the creative and the created. Genesis 2 and 7 was telling us that. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. That's the created side of man. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's the creative. They're both a portion of man. Both natures now are in this formed 
uh, vessel, for he is formed of the creative, filled or created and filled with the creative. The nature of man is a very narrow and limited capacity made to function within the created realm, while the nature of God is unlimited and infinite and is creative and is through it man can enter into those heavenly places. In Ephesians 3 and 6, he has raised us up together, made us to sit together with uh, in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now within the structure of this trinity, there are these two capacities then. The nature of God is the higher and the nature of man is the lower for the purpose of administrating God's purpose in this realm. The divine order within this trinity is that the higher capacity that the, is the nature of God always maintains dominion over the lower capacity in the trinity of the body. By this divine order, the will of God governs and the power of God performs as man in that administration of God takes place. In the design of creation, it is here that the trinity of man, in this trinity of man that God abides. It is here that we must that we will find God. It is here he must be sought. It is here that God will be found and experienced by the soul of, of, of man. God shows us this truth also in the beginning. Genesis 2, 7 and 8. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden uh, eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. God created the world, then he planted or affixed this garden or this creative place in the midst of it in two separate acts, two separate actions. The, <clears throat> this is the creative then being set by God in the midst of his created and by this breath of God in man. By the virtue of God's breath in man, this man is, is, is then qualified to be set by God in this creative place that is the garden. This is man, this, this is God in man by the breath, and man in garden by being placed in this creative realm. This is actually the life of God gathering the soul of man into that higher nature that is the life of God. It says in Genesis 3 and 8, they heard the voice of God in that garden. It is only here in this higher nature of God that we will commune with God as that lower nature enters that. Now because of the fallen perspective that we have, we have made the garden a, primarily a geographical place and an external manifestation. The garden and the promised land are where man accesses that higher nature, wherever that is. When man accesses that higher nature in that communion, the conditions that are the garden and the promised land will be manifest and we will see it. And that will not no longer be in, uh, to us primarily a geographical or external. It will become a spiritual and internal. And, and then wherever it takes place will be that garden or that promised land. The communion that takes place within this trinity, for that brief time that Adam was was in that garden, it was it was God in man and man in God, and that divine order of creation was in place, and the garden was entered. This is the promised land, wherever it takes place, and this is God's first revelation of heaven, and man's first uh, perception of heaven. 
Genesis 2.16, the Lord God commanded man, after placing him in the garden, he commanded him to eat from the garden. God told man, now you eat from where I have placed you, where you are. Man is standing in the garden. He's standing in the midst of the promised land there. He's in heaven. It is as in Second Peter 1, he said, you have obtained like precious faith. In that like precious faith is all things that pertain to uh, life and godliness by partaking of divine nature. This is what he was showing us in this garden situation in Genesis. If you just partake of nature, he told Adam, eat from this tree and all that heaven is will be opened up to you in, in its divine vistas, in its infinite spectrum. You don't have to struggle to get there. You don't have to wait for it to come. It's there as you partake of that which I have, where I have placed you. Genesis 2.17, it says, But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Within this trinity is heaven and man's ability to rise to it. Within this trinity took place the fall. It was when the lower nature rose up in rebellion against that higher nature that is the life of God. Bringing that lower nature into dominion brings the capacities of that nature into dominion with it. This is the death that God was warning us of. He, this is the death God warned, warned him that, that would take place. What has happened is that lower nature in dominion has lost touch with the higher nature, dying to it. And we now become captive to that lower nature in the realm of and limits of its perception. <clears throat> so he drove out man and placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. As that lower capacity takes dominion of the trinity of, of man, these, these uh, man loses contact with the higher side within uh, within him, and this loss is the loss of the garden, and it's the loss of the promised land. Simply by the limits created in that lower nature and that perspective. First Corinthians two, fourteen through sixteen says this: the natural man receives not the the things that are of God, uh, the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him; neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that we may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now that's telling me the natural doesn't receive, but we have the mind of Christ. The higher capacity, though it's lost to us, is still within that trinity. It still remains within man. God put his breath in man, and by virtue of God's breath in man, man is placed in that garden. In the fall, man is removed from the garden, but the breath is never removed from man. I, removed, I am removed from God, but God is not removed from me. God still is found within that trinity. That higher nature is still there within us. We then are prisoners to our own nature, and in that we are reduced to the religion of Egypt and the wilderness. Christ Jesus comes saying the kingdom is at hand in Matthew 4.17. He said in Matthew 6.33, seek the kingdom. And in Luke 17.21, he said that the kingdom is within you. Now he comes saying that he comes saying to us the kingdom is at hand. We must seek it and even telling us where it's found. It's within you. It's still within you. The seeking of the kingdom then is the rise of man within the Trinity 
by overcoming the limited perspective and again seeing what is there and partaking of that from which we stand in. Man is left now to seek the kingdom at the very door where man was blocked out, according to Genesis 3. It says that he drew, man is driven out, and, and cherubim and flaming swords block the way. It is by the very limits of the lower nature that, that keeps me from God that I am left to seek God. It is my senses that limit me that I must begin to find God. I seek God by a religion that is of Egypt or in the, or the wilderness, and I'm seeking him through senses by which I cannot find him. I has not seen, ear not heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. And yet it is by these senses in this dominant lower fact cap capacity by which I seek God. This is the doctrine of our religion. It is to know and experience God through channels that it's impossible to do so in a struggle that God never intended for us to have. God seeks to bring us out of this Egypt through this wilderness and into that promised land that is that higher capacity within each of us. He has to bring us out on an internal journey that is from one end of the Trinity within you from that lower capacity to that higher, from one set of senses and faculties to the other set, from one, from one perspective to another on a journey that is truly of perspective and dominion. The religion of Egypt is of the fallen perspective with eternal uh, identities and, and, and uh, priorities. In this it's m m most wonderfully demonstrated in what our idea of, of, of the rapture. We see God out there somewhere or up there somewhere. And the rapture is Him coming in some external matter, manner and, and catching us up and, and spiriting us away to uh, uh, streets of gold and gates of pearl. I do not suggest to you that that does not exist, for it does. But what I'm saying to you is that truth that we must be concerned with is a spiritual truth that will bring that manifestation. It's an internal truth that will bring that manifestation. In that, what I'm saying, it is the life of God that will catch us up and spirit us away. But that life is not out there. That life is in us. And that rapture is not external. That rapture is internal. And, and I am saying to you that God, by that life within me, is seeking on a daily basis to rapture me by taking that soul and causing it to rise above that lower capacity, bringing it into that higher capacity, and standing us in those heavenly places where heaven is our experience today in its first revelation and our first perception of that. And I'm saying to you, if the life of God within you and I cannot cause a resurrection that would lift me above that lower capacity and above self today, there will be no external manifestation of this. If God cannot get me to follow him now, I will not follow him then. The life of God is working in you and I right now to conquer the soul and to overcome the world. This is the rapture. Jesus said in Luke 11, I am the resurrection. Where you meet me, the resurrection takes place. This is God working in us on a daily basis to bring us into that promised land that is his purpose. This is a journey moving us upward from the created to the creative within that trinity of man. It is a journey out of Egypt through the wilderness and into the promised land. It is a journey where we will first find God within ourselves, then ourselves within God, until we finally find that nothing but God 
exists as he did in the beginning, so he is now. This journey begins in the external, moves into the eternal, and ends in the eternal. Amen.